thank you so much for joining us. Yes, welcome, of course, happy to be here. Great, so in many ways, I thought um, your book was a love letter for, um, from a daughter to a mother, but also from an immigrant to Canada as well. So you could have told your story without really telling your mother's story, but why was including that so important to you? Yeah, you know, like I, I really, I think, when you think about the genre of memoir, it hadn't been done like that, like this, at least in all the books that I read, and I love nonfiction. Um, and I remember, <laughs> I can say it now, but I remember when I was trying to get this books, like an agent to take me on, everyone turned me down, right? So I know you're gonna tell a story about your sport, but then you're gonna talk about your mother, nah, piss off. Um, but I, ha I stuck with that vision and it was important to me because her experience was so very much the foundation of my life. Um, and not only was it the foundation of my life, it was the foundation of my sport career. And I don't think um, people who got to know me through sport would truly appreciate or understand you know, the literal ups and downs that I went through without understanding the context and the backstory of you know, what that experience meant for me, what it went for my mother, what Athens, you know, being at that pinnacle of sport meant to her. And, and you could appreciate more, I guess, the, you know, the, the victories and the extreme yeah. lows when you understood, oh my God, look at the kind of the, the pathway that this family had to get to make something like this, this even possible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when she says you are the gold, you really truly see, you know, it's not just this cliche thing that a mother says, you understand why to her, you know, it, it's more than just that moment. Uh, her. So it was important for me to stick to that, to find a publisher and an agent who didn't try and change that in me at all. And I eventually found the right spot. So let's talk about the day you were born, which to me is like one of the most jarring scenes in the book. Um, talk about how you, first of all, how you got that story out of your mom. And what do you think about the family now? Yeah. Oh, the Harrys. You know what? In, in, <laughs> The book is what, nine months old now or something like that, eight or nine months old. And during the press run and even up until now, you know, you write a book, you don't know what's going to resonate. Like, ah, you think it's going to be the scene or that scene. And that was resounding. Like people fucking hate the Harrys, okay? They hate them. They're all dead now, which is why you can write those things and not be sued, which I couldn't have got sued because it's all true. <laughs> but anyways, um, all the legal stuff you go and you write a book, my, my editor's like, are you sure you want to write that? We're going to call you can't the lawyer. Do that. Right. That's, that's not okay. Yeah, but, like, that's not, uh, but, she's, uh, but you're like, this happened. Right, right. right? But, yeah. but, and here's the best, listen, the best defense against getting sued for libel, pro tip, is the truth. <laughs> and if it's the truth, their whole ancestry can come, okay? Come on, I'm ready for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so here's what I will say. And I, I have a clearer lens now because the book is out there and it's fine. But uh, my husband Morgan's also... Um, a journalist and you know a really really great sports writer and but he would overhear me getting these stories from my mom right because again I didn't have all these stories I wasn't there but I was getting these stories from my mom I remember one day he sat me down and again this man has you know written for New York Times written for Toronto Star you know he's been everywhere and he's like um you really and, and he was giving me a hard time he's like you need to be easy on your mom you're interrogating her like you're the FBI man <laughs> it's like yeah, I just want this story out and I'm saying this to say that now I can look back and I'm like, I was trying to get the story and I was trying to get it right. Yeah. And for me to get it truthfully, I couldn't put my emotions into it. Do you know what I mean? Like I wasn't telling the stories as this is my birth story and this was my mother, although I know she was, I had to completely be neutral and more be like the journalist that I was and like get that story and take my emotions out of it. Now looking back and the stories out there, I'm like, gosh, that it's all still so close to the surface and so close yeah. to my mom. So I think my approach to it, looking back at it, I'm not super proud of it. My mom's fine. She still loves me, but it was, I was so intent on, cause I, what I love about books um, that I read are putting me there. I want to know what the person smells like. I want to know what's on the wall. I want to know, yes, the internal dialogue, but like put me and immerse me. And for me to get that, I had to like, Okay, mom, yeah. like yeah. when she came down the stairs, like what did your what did your room look like in that basement? Like, oh, it was like makeshift, you yeah. know? So I think I got that story out of her by just separating myself from the actual story. 
Um, and like going to my mom multiple, like, again, this is like hours and years of interviewing her mm -hmm. and the people around her to get the story. So I wasn't super nice, but you know, we have a bestseller out of it. So it's all good now. It's all good. <laughs> it was all worth it. Yes. yes. <laughs> How difficult was it to kind of face some of the trauma associated with being in Canada, with just Canada? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, and, and that's another thing that, that came out during the press run were um, a lot of Canadians and especially white Canadians would apologize and, and say, I'm sorry for what your mother experienced and went through. And I remember we, you know, did like an exclusive interview with um, Agent Arsenault from the National. We went back to my high school, and we were sitting down and Agent Arsenault was pissed. Like she was pissed on my mother's behalf. She was pissed at the Harry's. And, and Agent Arsenault is one of the most sincere journalist that I know. Um, and even hearing her tell this story, she was so taken aback for it because I think the story really gave you a, part of having the platform and the name that I do and telling this story about domestic abuse and immigration and all those things is, it's not just this kind of, not that it's a nebula, nebulous story to anyone, like these stories are real and I think they're visceral for all of us, but now you actually see a name and a face and a name and a face that you recognize. So not that our story has more weight, but it's almost, there's a little bit more of an emotional connection and a yeah. reality to it. Like, Renita Felicia lived in a homeless shelter? Like her mom yeah. was not hardly paid by these folks, right? And so I think there is this sense of like, oh, this is what, you know, immigrants to Canada contend with and still contend with to this yeah. day. And I really think um, it was hard for my mother and I didn't realize how close to the surface these stories were. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to find the Harry's and there's no, um, you know, the trail is lost. The trail is lost. And, and that might be a sequel down the line where I, I try and find her grandkids and, and you know, cause we have names mm -hmm. and maybe try and find yeah. the grandkids and the great grandkids and see, I don't know that anyone would want to like own the story to be honest. They're them. like, no, we don't but know them. <laughs> don't know them. I don't know. Um, so, but it, and, and for me it was eye opening too, because I didn't know a lot of these stories, right? Yeah. My mom like, like I said, my mom would say things to us growing up and she would, you know, make mention of like, don't make stupidness with your life. And she would say, you know, when I first came to Canada and she'd, she'd recount a story of when she first came to Canada, you're six, you're 12. Yeah. My mother would confide in us all our life, right? Yes. Um, but I never could make sense of it. But as a kid, you grew up and you, you remember this story of her talking about the hair, yes. you this story of her saying this. And as I grew older, it's when I was like, what is, what are all these pieces? And then the yes. book was going back and putting them all together. But I was astonished, honestly, at what my mother had to do to make a life here. And um, I knew I always appreciated it, but I will tell you this, that the people who truly, whose eyes are open for this story are um, the, my, my, my siblings' children. And so my mother has about 15, 16 grandkids. So there's five of us. I have one and all my siblings have the rest. Mm -hmm. And so it was my nieces and nephews, some of them married in their 20s, some of them, you know, engaged and some of them young, about 11 or 12. And they're like, we did not know grandma and mom or auntie went through this. So they had no idea of my mother's struggle, none mm -hmm. at all. And here they are going to high school, here they are getting married and doing all this blissfully unaware, right? Second generation Canadian, yes. just like, okay, one nephew, Whatever, Isaiah, yeah. his last year of high school, he had the nerve to say he's not going to school during a snowstorm. And we took out the book and we're like, you're not going where? You're not, and he, didn't he not get his butt up? Did he not get his butt up? And he, <laughs> all the aunties got on the hotline bling, okay? On the WhatsApp video. And they're like, you, no, you don't make a mockery of this. You get your butt to school. You're not yeah. saying that. And he got it, right? And I think yeah. it was an eye opener, yes, to, to me for sure. But I think that next generation of like, oh, this is why we live how we live now. And yes. we're, we're good, we're good. And that's important that you're able to connect the dots because a lot of sometimes like a lot of immigrant families can't connect those dots because like our stories, like our parents don't really tell us their story like that. You have to sit it, you have to sit down and pry it out of them, right? So I think that's really important. So I wanna get back to your mom because mm. Kathy, I love Kathy, I love Auntie <laughs> Kathy. So your mom made a huge sacrifice um, when she had to leave her kids in St. Lucia mm -hmm. to come to Canada in hopes of a better life for herself and for them. Yeah. What have you learned about how different your life growing up in Canada was from their life in St. Lucia? Yeah, um, one of the things I, 
I, I would say, and I knew, and I was, I was, I was keenly aware that my life was very different from my mother's. Um, I don't know how I always knew that, right? Like I just knew we were different women. We were different people. Mm -hmm. um, and even to this day, my mom says stuff and does stuff. I'm like, what planet are you from, mom? You, what, what is happening? What are you, like, how are you rationalizing this, right? Like we're very different. Um, and I will say this, and this is me just being completely transparent, is um, I thought my rearing, um, how do I say this in a way that's not, because this is not a derogatory thing. This is like a first generation thing. It's like, well, I wouldn't do that. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I would never do that. Like I went to university, I wouldn't make that choice. Like I wouldn't, you know, um, and I would be like, oh, mom did that because she didn't know any better. She did, you know, and, and there was, um, and I hate to say this, but, and this is just in reflecting now in the book being out and just having to confront who you are, right? Like mm -hmm. it wasn't, I was better. It wasn't that. Cause I totally appreciate my mom's struggle, but there was something about it. And I think, again, it is the first, you know, world first generation thing where we kind of think like education and money and um, affluence makes us better than mm -hmm. maybe somebody who has to struggle or someone who doesn't have a fancy car, right? Uh, there's a, there's a privilege that we have, like, yeah. oh, I, I never have to clean a toilet or that sort yeah. of thing. And it was only in really mining my mother's story and seeing the strength that she had, how many of us would one have the adventurous spirit and the fortitude to leave what we know, yeah. right? To complete, like, I'm not doing that. Someone tell me right now, you moved to Australia, you moved to Zanzibar, you moved to Germany. I'm not going nowhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. it's going to be better, but like generations from now, not going. I like Ajax, Ontario very much. Thank you. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not leaving. I'm not even curious enough to do that, yeah. right? And maybe that's a whole different lens. But I think in, in, the, in what this story taught me, and I hope it, what it, it's taught some of us is the things that we praise, and the things that we put on a pedestal, our degrees, um, our bank accounts, our you know RSPs, and all those sorts of things, are you know our um, our cars, our titles. Fight mm -hmm. for that title at work, don't you? Yeah, not not more pay, but you love the title. Yeah. And sometimes the people among us, like my mother, has single handedly, and this is going to be the whole documentary because that's the whole next thing I want to go with this, has changed a generation. My mother has not just changed my generation, my two-year-old daughter, her life is markedly different than my mother's, than my aunt's, than my grandmother's. Yeah. And that is currency that you really can't put a value on. Like this little degree mm -hmm. I have from the University of Illinois, I love it, it's so cute over there. You can't see this off camera, mm -hmm. but I'm so proud of that, right? But then I look at how my mom has transformed this life of mine and how that will actually ripple out for forever right? As long as this earth exists, yeah. that will ripple out. I believe that. And I'm seeing it in my nieces and nephews. That yeah. to me is like, okay, I can go out and run a hurdle and win a gold medal. That's not the journey. That's not the prize. That is not it. What have I done with that journey? What have I done with my life, right? What have I done with my existence? And to me, those are the people that we need to start acknowledging and praising and, and putting on a pedestal more. In our, in our society, we don't tend to do that. It's the, you know, it's the hockey stars and it's the Hall of Famers and it's the, you know, the millionaire CEOs making a lot of money. It. It's fine. Yeah, that's not it, right? Yeah. It's not. And so I feel like I've even woken up to that. Like the way I would be like, well, I'm different from my mom. I wouldn't make this decision for myself. And I'm different. It's like, no, sister, you could not walk a mile in her shoes and mm -hmm. what she's done you you couldn't even touch that right and it's it's um it's there's a reference there that i never had and i appreciate having now wow that that's so well well said <laughs> <laughs> um one of the things i also loved about kathy is that um she made things happen for her kids like bingo came through big time on two occasions we were just talking about bingo <laughs> Yes. So did you feel that growing up, like no matter what, she would help you find a way to get through? Yeah, my mother is, she doesn't, she, she finds a way. She finds a way. And bingo is a theme in the book, but it was a theme of us growing up. That was her little escape. Totally gambling and totally like, not how you say it. Half of us are like, we're going to go to bingo now. <laughs> 
Listen, B15 was her number. Let me tell you, B15. But that was her thing. And so you know, we were trained when people would call the house. Uh, where's your mom? She's at the office, right? It's like all 10 o'clock at night, okay? The office is bingo. That was like our code name for bingo. Like she trained us, right? Like totally, totally my mother. But she would find a way. And I, I know it pained my mother because she didn't always have money to give us, right? She didn't have money to give us. Um, but she had her love. And I think what really rings out for me is when my mother and I and my sister leave the women's shelter, the Denise house, Obege at the time, and we get our place in Pickering, my mother wasted no time getting her remaining children to Pickering, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And that is something she could have waited another decade to do because they were fine there. My, my, my grandmother was taking care of them. You know, you climb up a tree, get a, get a breadfruit, roast it. They're not hungry. Mm -hmm. um, but her sense of duty, her sense of it had been long enough. Her sense of my mission is not fully completed, but I am on my own two feet. I'm on my own now. And if we are going to struggle, we'll struggle together. together. And that was her mission. Um, but I want to I want to be honest. Like there was a price that my mother paid for um, for her choice, right? Like mm -hmm. till this day, wonder like my sister. And we're all loving and we're all close. But the bond that my so my, she's yeah she's the fourth has with my mom is very different than the bond that I have with my mother and, you know, Vonette has with my mother, right? It's very different. When my, when my mother left, she was one, right? Mm -hmm. And when they were united again, my, my, my sister was nearly five. And any of you who are parents or, you know, aunties and uncles, you know, those years are impressionable years. You know, those years are bonding years, years to really, you know, and my mother paid that price. Because, you know, till this day, my mom will call us and, and, you know, we're all close, right? Of course, but the one that she won't hear from regularly as much, like we'll talk every day. My mother and I will talk every day. You know, her and my older sister will talk every day. She's like, oh, Wanda didn't call me this week, right? Like, because that bond is not as imprinted. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. As it is with others. So, you know, when we talk about the immigrant story and the immigrant experience, um, and we kind of like paint this picture of like, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and you've made it. Have no doubt that immigrants who come here and toil and try and make a life for themselves, you know, they pay a price for that. Yes. And their children pay a price for that. It's not this great, big, beautiful Taibo and there's the quintessential Canadian immigrant story. It's not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just one of the costs that she's had to pay. But my mother truly, till this day, I know she would make that same decision. I know that my sister, loves our mother and understands why she did, she did it. Um, but there was just something kind of just natural there that they missed out on. That they um, and 30 something years later, it, it, it's still there. We all see it and sense it. And it's like, call your mother, girl. Like it's been yeah. five days. Like that's past the quota in our family. You call her, right? So it's it just what it is. <laughs> so let's talk about um, 2004. Yeah. I just remember I remember watching and I remember hurting for you. Mm -hmm. So what did, what did that experience teach you? And how, how did you feel like after that experience? How did you feel after that crash? And how did you pull yourself back out of that? Yeah, yeah it's, you know, the thing, you know, we all have our grief, right? In the stages of grief and all the different stages. I don't have them memorized, but I think one of them is acceptance and whatever. I don't know that I buy that. I don't know that I ever bought into the acceptance of it. Like that's Athens right there. I was killing them, okay? That wasn't the final, that was the semi-final. There's three rounds. So that was the second of three rounds. Um, and I don't think this is what, 2022, that was 2024, 2004, 17, 20, 18 years or something like that, whatever, 18 years. I'm not over it. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever be over it. And it's okay for me not to be over it. I've just made peace with it. Yeah. And I've taken that pain and decided to use it as fuel and to do something about it. And, you know, it's interesting for a long while, it would follow me like, you know, those like when people are in jail and they put the ball and chain on their thing, there should be a name for that, whatever. Like, I feel like this thing was following me everywhere on my life. It was, it was quite annoying. You know, imagine like in Loblaws checking out, oh, you're the girl that fell at the Olympics or you're at the Harvey's, you know, buying your poutine. Oh, do people do that? Oh yes, girl, real life. I listen, I can make a coffee table book about how I've been approached about this one race, okay? <laughs> That's horrible. And, yeah. And here, and it does feel horrible at times. I will be honest with you. Um, but again, this is years. Remember, this is like almost two decades now, almost yeah. in my life. 
but it is, um, I don't know that people understand it as a trauma, right? Like you wouldn't go over to someone and say, man, your dog died. Let's talk about it in the Harvey's line or your parent or someone passed away, God forbid. Like you wouldn't approach someone like that. And I, I think yeah. a trauma like that, a lot of people who are sports fans or just naturally a, a fan of you or, or, or like you admire you don't necessarily see talking about it and bring it up out of context when you're not yeah. ready for it is you going and experiencing that moment all over again. Yeah. And I think, I, I think I've been very graceful with it. I recognize that and I understand that. So when people come up to me, I, I, I go with it. And it, it honestly is probably a, a, a two or three years in the making where I'm like, um, I'm more at peace with it. I'm more, you know, every year it gets easier to live with the disappointment of it. And like more mm -hmm. the curiosity of like, what would it been? Like, there's nothing in my mind that told me I would have not like smashed my record and been Olympic champion. Like I knew it, it, I just had too much power. Like there was, my body had never felt that much power and that hurdle came up too quick, couldn't deal, right? Had I had more time yeah. to like harness the power and recognize the power, but nothing in your dreams, nothing in practice can like, have your body manifest that moment. My body's like, oh, you want this? Oh, we're doing this? Unleash it? Boom. Can't do that in practice. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. and, and I got everything mm -hmm. in that moment. It was too much for me to manage. And I think now when people come up to me, I recognize I appreciate it now, right? Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate it because if you didn't give a damn about me, if you didn't give a damn about that moment, if you didn't stop what the hell you were doing, because people were like, I stopped what I was doing. I know exactly where I was on that day. Yeah. I appreciate that. That means there's something in that moment, in that day that you connected with me. And so when you come up to me, you're not coming up to me to like bring me back there. You don't even know you're doing that. You're bringing me, you're, you're bringing it up because there's something about that in that moment that you're like, I see you. I remember that. Like, I feel for you. When I have to remember that, people are crying for me. Like people are hurting mm -hmm. for me. And I think that makes it easier in those moments where maybe I'm not ready to talk about it or it's completely caught me off guard because all I want to do is stuff my face with cheese mm -hmm. curds. That is okay. <laughs> um, but I have made peace with it. And now for me, honestly, it's just a tool that I use um, to help others. It's a, it's a well that I draw from that I'm hoping other people can, can, can draw from also. Okay, I think we have a question. Yeah. Okay, some things are meant to be discovered. Is this real wisdom from another generation whose mantra was leave it alone? Or was this her way of saying you can't handle the truth or I don't want to tell you? Were you satisfied with Paulette's answer? Oh, someone's asking me about Paulette. You know what, Paulette doesn't come up in discussions. And honestly, when I'm <laughs> writing, I'm like, she's such a problematic person. Like. <laughs> How is she not coming up more? How are people not asking about her? That is such a good question. I've wanted to talk about her so much. She's still around. She still <laughs> talks to my mom. I don't know if she's read the book. She's still she still talk. talks to your mom? Yeah, it's so weird. This is what I'm telling you. Me and my mom are from different worlds. This, do you see what I say when me and my mom are different? Because I would have done burned her number in my Rolodex like a long time ago. Like, whatever. What is the Montreal area code 514? Bye. Um, so what question? I, I wrestle with her. I wrestle with her. I wrestle with her. And I truly believe she's the one person out of anybody because her memory is so sharp. And she was more connected to, to my bio dad's kind of pool of friends, you know, that kind of young Nigerian kind of thing. I do believe she knows more than she ever has told me. Mm -hmm. And I believe she was very guarded for a reason. Yet I don't know what that reason is. And one of the failings I feel I had in not writing the book, but like, you know, I, I talked to so many people throughout this book over how many years it took me to write it. And she was one of the hardest people to interrogate, not interrogate, my husband says interrogate, to interview. Because had I been, had she been someone else, I could have gone harder and more in on her and called her out on her stuff. I, I could never call my aunt out on her stuff. And I think there's also this like West Indian, this cultural, like you respect your elders, you don't whatever. And I was already doing a taboo thing culturally in like airing this kind of- The dirty family, laundry. Dirty laundry, right? Like, oh my God, you don't know your dad, you're revealing that. You have different dads, you're revealing that. Like all this stuff that I've revealed in this book yeah. has set me free, has set my family free. But it's also very much like, 
why are you writing that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So now to ask my aunt all these things in that way, I was still bound by this cultural kind of, you know, I knew my level, I knew my place, you know what I mean? And so the answer is, she knows more than she, she's telling us. There's something that she's hiding and she's keeping. The fact that she would fix her mouth to tell me, oh, cer certain things aren't meant to be, I want to slap her. Yeah, I can't say that. I want to slap her though. Um, I'm nonviolent, by the way. But I'm like, that was. <laughs> and, you just wanted to shake her. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what are you hiding? What do you know that I don't know? Also till this day, it wasn't until writing my mother's daughter. This whole time, like, you remember the scene where my mother was like, um, she had a little camera or whatever. And she was like taking pictures of me when I was born. She's writing my yes. name, my birthday, yeah. my gender. Yeah. And then she's giving it to Paulette to give yeah. to like Victor or to my dad, like whatever. All these years, my mother thought this package was delivered. It took the, the writing of this book 2014 to 2016. I probably interviewed her in 2014, 15, 16 ish for my mom to realize, oh, you never gave that to him. So what I've come to realize is, and I think this is a great like second book or like documentary type thing, right? I'm always thinking ahead. I don't know that David knows my name or my gender or my date of birth the way that I thought we all assumed he would and he did because this package with all my vitals would have been given to him. Maybe he mm -hmm. does through like word of mouth her telling her boyfriend or her telling him, we don't know, she hasn't told me that. She never even told us about that visit, right? Um, so now all the details that I thought this bio dad knew, I'm not certain he knows them because we don't know. And again, you'll remember, she came to visit when I was a little bit older and she had all these pictures of me when I was yeah. like a baby. Those were the damn pictures from 1980. <laughs> that, the that she was supposed to give to your dad. She was supposed to give to the bio dad. So when she showed up in Pickering and was giving me these pictures, <laughs> and I was so grateful to have them because I'd never seen myself as a baby, right? So she came in, I'm loving having this package. Don't you know that was the package that was from Davis package? Like, do you see how Paulette is problematic? Do you see like, but That's what do you crazy. do? Yeah, it's yeah. crazy, it's nuts. I don't, I don't even know what you do with that. And even talking about it, I'm now heated. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> no more Paulette. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good, it's good, it's good. I've never talked about Paulette. This is good. It's all good. Um, any more questions while we have her? I feel like we've almost gotten it, but is there a scoop to be had here about what the next book is going to be? And I say this entirely out of self-interest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so listen, like, uh, I need to, okay, so book number two, so I have a, a really, I want this, My Mother's Daughter to be like in, in film somehow, like more of a doc, maybe like a docu-series, multi-series, because I think there is something very special. If you think about all the tentacles, like, all the things my mother has been able to do and achieve and how it's rippled out. I think there's something really beautiful about telling that story. The other thing though, is like, I really, I'm wrestling with where I am about how I feel about David, the character, like, you know, the bio dad, which is what I call him. But I do feel like there's something about, because I have a two-year-old now. Um, and one of the things I was really upset for a while with my mother was I felt like she let the trail of of David run cold. I felt like, yes. you know, like you could have gotten the answers and maybe they weren't like, maybe it was messy and maybe we didn't know everything, but like you never got those. And now I realize my mother's life was so busy with just trying to have us survive and flourish and be good. Yep. She has no time to go be no investigative journalist and no yep. archivist and go figure out this man. Like that's not her problem, yep. right? So I, I, I appreciate that now, but it's something like, so I guess with Nova, my two-year-old daughter, I feel like, am I repeating that part of it? Like, could she one day be 15 and 17? And, you know, I don't consider myself Nigerian. Like I don't identify with that, but I am, right? And do I owe it to my child in the way I felt my mother kind of maybe owed it to me or us to have some answers? So if Noah's 15 or 20 and one day says like, who is David? Man, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like read the book, Like <laughs> that's all I have. Do I owe it to her to kind of maybe, and I feel like that could be a documentary, maybe like I travel back there, maybe I try and find find him, ugh, like find the roots, or maybe what it means to be Nigel, what it means to like, yes, that's you know what I was gonna say. That's yeah. 
Yeah. And also so not necessarily also, find him, but kind of like look at your Nigerian roots. Yeah. Like I think maybe that's it. And again, like I don't know if you you saw me confronting it or wrestling with it on the page. Like I know the culture is beautiful. You know, you know, I have friends, it's so stupid. My friends are Nigerian, but like, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I appreciate the culture and I and I see yeah. how colorful and amazing it is. And but I don't have an identity to it. And I think do I not have an identity to it because it's like the one last big like to the bio yeah. dad? Do you know what I mean? Like that's my one last holdout to him. Like to acknowledge that would be acknowledging him, and he doesn't deserve that. But it's spiting me. And if my daughter asks me, anyways, a long big rabbit hole. So the answer, which I don't have for you, is <laughs> couple documentary ideas. Okay, so book number two. I'm I'll hearing a Canada Council travel grant to Nigeria. I'm hearing, <laughs> you know. Is it Speak it into existence. Speak Listen, it. Speak it into existence, okay? And call me later. We need to discuss this. You know? Okay? <laughs> yeah. And, and the other idea, too, is because Wonder's father is German, and that's a whole other sort of tale, it really could be sisters looking for, like, that paternal identity. Yeah. Looking to, see, Yeah, and maybe she goes to mm -hmm. Germany with her family and her three kids and her husband. I go with Nova and my husband to, you know what I mean? Maybe that's a whole, would y'all watch that? Would you guys watch I would that? Watch yes. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so I love all the thumbs up. Thank you, girl. Thank you. That's Chelsea. Um, but I'm thinking book number two really for me. Um, I for a year I've been I wrote it, not didn't write it. In 2022, I started writing book number two during the pandemic. For a whole year now, I have not been able to revisit it. And my mentor's like, write this damn book already. So book number two, I think why why I'm wrestling with it is I don't know what I'm what I'm what I'm saying yet. Like, what is your point? But it really is um it's about fertility. It's about motherhood. It's about, I think a lot of the lessons that I've learned through that. And, and it, the only reason it's, it's, it's still in my brain is because, you know, I'm, I'm 41, going to be 52. And, you know, I stopped running track and then my, Morgan and I are like, okay, let's have a kids. Okay, cool. We're like 39. He's like 40 something. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't. And so we had to go through IVF and all of that. And I, I don't know what I'm coming to say in this book yet, but there's something about, um, being an athlete who's gone after something, been so driven and, and you know how to control certain things, you know how to go after something. And suddenly I wanna go after this thing and it's like, oh no, you can't have it. And so the struggle mm -hmm. of that, plus also looking at my mother's journey, my journey, Nova's like that three generational thing, something about that, whether it's like lessons from sport and motherhood and career, plus also women in my generation, like delaying motherhood so long, yeah. right? Like yeah. everyone told me as an athlete, here's how you don't get pregnant. Well, yeah, you take the pill. <laughs> Great, fantastic. That's cute. No one said, here's how you preserve your fertility. No one had yeah. that conversation with me, right? And let me tell you about freezing 38-year-old eggs. They're not that fresh, okay? They're not that fresh. Okay? <laughs> now, if you freeze 28-year-old eggs, apparently you have better odds, okay? So I'm still in this like <laughs> fertility cycle. I'm still on the journey. I'd love to give Nova a sibling. And I think um, that could be book number two, but I just don't know what it is yet. And maybe I don't know what it is yet because I'm still in it. Do you know what I mean? In it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, it might be lessons or something. Does that sound boring? Hopefully it doesn't sound boring. <laughs> no. Like, no. I'm figuring it out. Okay, we have, okay, we have more questions. Well, yeah. okay. Yeah. As a mother, what kind of story do you hope your child will be telling about you 20 years from now? Ooh, child. Keeping it light. Listen, can I tell you about Miss Nova, though? Like, I'm not her I love preferred Nova. Parent. Nova, she's going, she's going to be three at the end of April. I'm not her preferred parent, which I'm at peace with. So I'll walk in the door and she'll be like, go away, mama. Go away. Go away, mama. Oh, God. Rude. R just rude. Mess. And then she wants her dad. Where's daddy? Where's daddy? Okay, I, I spent 39 hours with you in labor. I pushed you out, he didn't do a lot, but where's daddy? Okay, whatever. I hope, I take it very personally, as you can see, hopefully this is okay. Hopefully this is just it what- Changes, it, it changes though. It changes for sure, yeah. Oh, she's, I'm struggling, My daughter's honestly, back and forth. Like, it changes. I hope so, she doesn't want to deal with me at all. Cause I, I don't let her get away with stuff the way he does. It's, I, I take it personally, but I'm glad to know it does change. So I'll, I'll hang in there. <laughs> You know, um, I've never been asked that. And that's a really beautiful question. It's because it, you're forcing me to like see myself as a 60 something year old, which is my mother's age, right? Which is kind of cool, kind of cool, right? What kind of mom will I be? Um, 
I really do hope for Nova that um, she sees just the lineage that she comes from, right? And my aunt, you know, is like a secondary char secondary character in the book, right? My mom's sister. But if you think about her role was very pivotal, right? Once she cursed out that man that was mocking my mom for like apparently being deported. Like, do you guys remember that scene, right? Um, but then she helped my grandmother raise my mother's children while she was gone, yes. right? And she's much older than my mom. She's like 80 something now. And she's like, how many years older than my mom? Very much older than my mom. But I really hope Nova sees her aunt her grandmother, her her um her own mother, and then sees the strength that she comes from, right? And you know what? This motherhood journey is so strange to me because I'm parenting differently than my own mother, right? Yeah. Like I don't spank, right? Mm -hmm. My mom does spank her. The mom will hit her on the hand, and she said, "Grandma hit me. I didn't like it." I was like, "Well, I, look, I can't undo it. I don't spank, but my mom will, yeah, slapped, whatever." So I'm I, I'm not parenting in my mom's style, right? And I'm and unparenting certain things that I learned that weren't necessarily bad. It's what my mother knew, but I don't know yeah. that it's con conducive for that to continue on, right? I don't know if it's necessary for it to continue on. Like, and I will say this, writing my mother's daughter and having a child at the same time was very cathartic because I mm -hmm. assumed that for me to be strong, I had to pass on struggle, right? And when I looked around, I'm like, oh, there's no more struggle to be had. Like I'm on the cover of magazines, I'm doing good things and you know, I'm okay. I panicked as I was pregnant because I'm like, I thought struggle is what fortified me. I thought struggle is what made me, made me, made me. And when yeah. I looked around, I'm like, damn, this baby is going to be really soft and like goes to the world and be taken advantage of because there's nothing to toughen her up. And I need to yeah. toughen her up. And I was looking around for problems to give this unborn child, okay? And <laughs> I realized, no, the cycle should stop here. The things yeah. that I inherited and that my mom, my mom stopped the cycle as well, right? My mom stopped her own cycles so that yeah. we didn't have to inherit them. And of course, some things, you know, still trickle on, but I can stop that here. And I realized that my mom didn't necessarily pass on struggle to us, even though we struggled. What my mom truly passed on was her character. Yeah. And she passed on being so true and sure to who she was as a woman and as Kathy, that by seeing her, by modeling that, I had that permission as a woman, as a mother in my own life. And so what mm -hmm. I hope Nova has right? It's just, I'm being so sure and strong of myself, right? Um, as a woman, as a mother, that that simply gives her permission. It's not, yeah. here's the struggle, here's the, here's the poor, here's the shelter. No, 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 no. It's despite all those things that my mother encountered, all that adversity, all the hurdles, Kathy was still Kathy. And she took that woman's playbook and she burnt it up. And she said, oh, society wants me to look this way and live this way and be this way. I'm gonna live my life this way and I'm gonna do better when I when I can, but this is who I am unapologetically. And I think for me, that's what I want Nova to be and to say yes. about me down the line. That's beautiful. Someone says your mom's active and intentional stopping of cycle is one of the most lasting and powerful messages from this book. Mm, oh, thank that's you, nice. that's lovely, I agree. Um, someone is asking about your abusive father. Mm. All the missing dad's piece have really bugged me. I want their feet held to the fire. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I, in the end of the book, you kind of forgave your dad. Um, how did you get there? Yeah, there was a long time. It's so interesting. I think, um, yeah, I still, I still, I remember doing, um, it, um, a podcast interview with um, with Heather, who's like the CEO of Indigo. And I remember her saying to me, it wasn't a criticism of my mother's daughter at all, but it was an observation. Um, and and books, are, books should be critiqued. Books should be, I had an issue with how the author made this decision or I had an issue with this character. Absolutely, that's how I consume books, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but don't do it to my book, no, just joking. Um, <laughs> but Heather Raceman said to me, she's like, I guess she felt I wasn't angry enough, right? Yeah. At my dad, my, you know, the man who raised me. And I guess she didn't see that venom enough from my mother or me. Fair, fair, fair critique, fair observation. Um, and I remember saying that to someone else uh, and they disagreed with her, which I'm like, I love a good debate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that is, I think I agree with Heather in that she's right. The, mm -hmm. the heat, the venom, all of that, no. 
but I can't create a narrative that doesn't exist in our in our family's ecosystem and in our life. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I think would have made it a more salacious and juicy read if we're like, we said you at the Christmas party, we took the damn pie, we threw it in his face, we kicked him out. <laughs> no, you're like no. that just didn't happen. <laughs> it happened, and you have to understand who my mother is, right? It's yeah. her mentality, her heart, her forgiving spirit. Why yeah. she could endure and live in a family's basement who gave her no time off while she's pregnant. It's knowing that if she let that, that venom, if she let that anger, just, it's another weight. It's another mm-hmm. distraction. It's just another thing to boggle her down on her journey and slow her. And she didn't have time for that. Right. And so for my mom to hold anger and venom towards my father, that's just not in her nature sincerely. Yeah. And again, when I said to you guys earlier on, man, me and my mom are different because let me tell you, Sir Bob, Sir Bob, <laughs> right? I, thought I am my mother's daughter, quite literally. And my mother, this is where my mother lands, even till this day. And there's a long phase. So I guess I, I, I refute the fact that saying that we didn't get angry, at least I know there's a, many years of my life in my 20s where I didn't talk to my, my dad for a really long time yeah. in my life. Um, and so... My mother till this day, she won't defend him and excuse him, never, ever. Mm-hmm. But you have to understand, and you've all read the book. You saw my mom after she comes back with all her kids. She has wonder. She is trying to get to Canada. She is writing letters to friends, to old pe- to other people that she used to like nanny for. And she's trying to get someone to bring her back to Canada. Nobody mm-hmm. does. One random day, this man writes her a letter and says, bring yourself come not only does he say come on he says bring Perdita, who is canadian yeah. born and my mm-hmm. life is very different because i am canadian born and I, and I and i know it is it's very different than my older siblings life right and and, and there's privilege in that and so my and, and that was the door right do you see how that was the key that was the yeah. door yeah. and for my mother the woman and the loving woman that she is for all that my mother has done which she does not excuse She also knows, had it not been for him saying, come back, bring Perdita, she doesn't know if we ever, ever, ever would have made it back to Canada. And St. Lucia is beautiful, it's colorful, but she wanted more than all of us selling on a beach. And can Mm -hmm. I tell you, just based on this damn picture, I've done more than sell on a beach. My siblings have done lots more than selling on a beach. My mom wanted more. And so I think that's why it's hard for her to ever, ever turn her back on that man. She can't, yeah. you know what I mean? And so as a woman, you see your kids thriving. We had to go through hell with him, yes. But you, mm-hmm. see your, you see your children having their houses, having their spouses. You see your grandkids. My mother has a great grandchild. Like she has a great mm-hmm. grandchild that calls her Gigi, great grand, like who's like two, right? And who plays with Nova. Like for my mother, seeing her, gen- like the lineage, she can't, she, she, that's not who can't, she is. Yeah. Now, me, but because she's raised me to love him and I do love mm-hmm. my dad, I love my dad. I, I can't turn my back on him either, but our relationship is not, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, typical. It's not, it's different. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> um, okay, another question. I guess we will do one more. Yeah. How is your mom doing now? Hmm. Thank you for asking that. Good, <laughs> really good. She retired a year ago. She helps me out with the Nova a lot. Like I'm about to host the Olympics for two, two and a half weeks. So 16 days. So she's moving in to help my husband help Nova. Um, and, and that's what her life is now. Like my mother will drop everything to help us. Um, she's mm-hmm. married to Papa Dave. Uh, they live by the lake. They have a really beautiful home by the water um, in Ajax. She's happy. She's happy. My mother really is. Um, and that's what we just want for her. We don't want her to struggle. Oh, look, she's been retired for a year and there's a new nursing home. If any of you are ever, like from the Durham region area, but there's a new nursing home being opened by like Ajax, or they call it Lake Ridge Health or whatever, like Ajax. And then she called me the other day. She's like, Fadid, do you know how to do a resume? I'm like, a resume? For who? Like for me. She's like, they're opening a new nursing home. I'm like, okay. She's like, I'm going to see if I can get you. I'm like, if you don't sit your tail down and be, be bored at home, and, and enjoy your retirement. Where are you going? <laughs> so she, she's doing well. She has, she has nothing to do clearly, but she is doing really, really well. And we're really, really happy um, 
with with where her life is and and just she's married she's happily married it's just it's beautiful to see it's beautiful to see yes. yeah well thank you so much Pradita, for talking yeah, to me you. talking to us